It's one of the great cosmic mysteries. How is that someone can go from being a total stranger to being the most important person in your life? What do you want to be when you're 40? Am I allowed to say rich? What about you? I want to do something that actually makes a difference. Change the world, you mean? Maybe just my own tiny corner of it. You have all these people telling you how great you are. You know, smart, and funny, talented. Boy. I've been telling you for years. So why don't you believe it? He's still mates with Dexter. He's doing all right for himself. Pizza Express would have been fine. After we met, I had a bit of a crush on you. So what happened to it? This crush. Back in the late 80s, it was all I thought about. And now? I thought I finally got rid of you. I don't think you can. Let's pick up the phone, Emma. We're with Dex and M, aren't we? Imagine one selected day struck out of your life and think how different its course would have been. Hello, hello. To everyone in the room, welcome back. It was an honor to Netflix and chill with you. <laughs> And to everyone joining us on YouTube, welcome to the official premiere of Netflix's One Day. We have just watched the first three episodes. We laughed, we cried, we had several epiphanies. <laughs> I had goosebumps all over my body and I'm so excited to be introducing the cast and crew onto the stage to talk about this amazing project because One Day is dropping on Netflix on the 8th of February. So if you had plans for Thursday, Cancel them, please. On behalf of everyone in this room, cancel those plans. So, without further ado, I am honored to invite to the stage the cast of the show, Amber Kamad, Leo Woodall, our writer, Nicole Taylor. Nicole's on her way. <laughs> the writer of the novel, David Nichols. and our incredible director, Molly Manners. Okay, so, that was exciting. How do you feel? It's, it's gonna be out in the world. You've been sitting on this for a little while. And um, Ambika, I'd love to start with you. We saw you in the amazing This Is Going To Hurt. Now, Emma is obviously a bit of a departure from that character that you played in This Is Going To Hurt. So how was that experience of channeling someone so completely different? Uh, it was mainly the accent, to be honest. Um, no, uh, it was very, very different. And uh, I'm a massive, massive fan of the book. So it was a big undertaking. And um, yeah, I mean, how often do you get to play a part over 20 years? It felt like a huge responsibility and yeah, very grateful to have been to play her and been in the show. And you really bring her to life, so we're Thank so you. grateful that you did. <laughs> and Leo, you were cast in this show before you actually were on The White Lotus. My gym has actually recently added The White Lotus theme tune to its playlist, <laughs> which is like a little bit ominous when you're just trying to work out. I'm like, <laughs> am I gonna get Jennifer Coolidge in the gym? <laughs> um, but I'd love to know what was the process of auditioning for the role um, for one day? Um, I was um, filming Lotus when I was auditioning for this. And I um, came into the room for the first time <laughs> with Molly Manners and Rachel Sheridan with my cowabunga tattoo still on my neck. Um, and they thought it was real. <laughs> so they panicked. And then as the audition kind of continued, it started to come off. And so they <laughs> they could maybe breathe a sigh of relief. Um, 
and yeah, we were both just kind of auditioning for the following month or so after that. Yeah, and Nicole. So, Nicole, you are a BAFTA winning screenwriter, which is incredible. And we're actually coming to you live from BAFTA tonight. And many people will remember your phenomenally powerful series, Three Girls. And I wanted to know how the offer of adapting one day came to you um, and were you a fan of the book when you were approached to write this series? The opportunity came in to uh, adapt this when I had a week old baby and I had already decided I'm not looking at any work for a whole year no matter how amazing it is. A week old baby and in comes this from uh, Rowana and Jude and it just catapulted me back to how I felt when I first read that book. I was, uh, yeah, I mean, I was one of the early adopters and I, I, I remember feeling like, wow, this is about me. Emma is me. Someone's written a book about me. And I was just so obsessed with it. Just really, it, it felt like it was just exactly what it was like to be me in my 20s, especially. I read it when I was 29. And then, of course, suddenly it's everywhere. And like my thing, my beautiful thing that I discovered and meant everything to me was like all over the place. And then I think I forgot about it for a while. And then somehow, just getting this email, I was like, no, I've got to just double check that it's right to turn this down. Let me just have a wee peek at that lost love, that book I once that once meant everything to me. And of course, I read the whole thing in one night, reread it. And not only did it you know, stand the test of time, whatever, it felt like, I feel embarrassing this next to you, David, but it felt like a book, like a proper British classic that people will be reading in 100 years time. And reading it at 40 compared to reading it at 29 it was just such a rich experience to read it at such different parts of my life so yeah I just couldn't believe my luck and said yes but please wait till I grow up a wee baby for a bit longer so they did and thank you for that yeah incredible and I mean it really has stood the test of time I have some stats here so one day came out 15 years ago and since then it sold over 6 million copies and been translated into over 40 languages now David, <laughs> I am fanboying a little bit because we all think you're incredible. I'd love to know, did you imagine that all of this was, was coming your way when you first started to pen this novel? Yep, yep. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that was the intention. <laughs> As you should. It was, uh, it was a real surprise. I mean, it, it, I, I got a little bit stuck with my script writing, got a bit stuck with novel writing, didn't really know what to do, and I'd... I'd um, I knew I wanted to write, I just turned uh, 40, or it's coming up to 40, I can't remember which, but I wanted to write something about that, you know, that gap, how, you, how life changes in those 20 years and how unexpected it is and all the twists and turns. And uh, I didn't really know how to approach it because um, so I, I was a screenwriter before I was a novelist, and screenwriters tend to think in kind of units of action. It's they tend to think of, you know, this is the bit where, this is the bit where, this is the bit where. And when you tell a great spread of time, you think, well, how am I, what am I going to choose? And if you tell a love story, are, are you going to tell the same familiar beats? And this idea came up. I got it from a passage in Tess of the Devils that I'd always loved as a teenager about how every year we pass through anniversaries that we don't yet know the significance of. And that, that passage had always stayed with me since I was a teenager. And I just adapted Tess for the BBC. And so I was very aware about passage and I thought well maybe that's what you do maybe you write about a day which has the si a significance of which the characters aren't aware and that was the premise and it also meant that I could think in terms of sort of snapshots 20, 20 scenes in different styles uh, different settings and that you could see the characters grow old. all the big stuff you know the weddings and the proposals and all of that stuff would happen off to the side but you'd have this little narrative hook which is what happened in between and that was the premise, and I, I spent a long time planning it and then a longer time writing it because there was no great pressure from my publishers. They let me get on with it, and it was a, a really happy writing experience. I really grew to love them, and uh, uh, yeah, it was, it, so it, 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 it's not always the case that the things you really love writing communicate in that way, and, and I had no expectation of that, but I did um, really work at it and, and love it and love M and Dex. But the whole thing that happened was a huge surprise to me and a, a great privilege. You know, I'm, I'm extremely, there's lots in the book I'd change and tweak and not do now. Uh, it's very much a book of, of that time in my life, uh, but I, I've always been proud of it and loved it. And it's amazing to see uh, what Nicole and this team have done with it and the way they've 
stayed very, very loyal to it, but also refreshed it and made it feel uh, new. I'm extremely grateful. I'm very, very lucky to have had that experience. Yeah, and for the fans of the book too, I think we're all so excited to see it get a new, you know, breath of air put into it and, and, and see it um, reach a new audience as well, which is really exciting. Now, Molly, you are the person who helped bring these episodes to life. You directed the first three episodes and also episode 14, which is the final episode. Now, when you're approaching characters over the course of 20 years, you've got the joys, the challenges of their lives. How do you even begin to, to approach that? Um, yeah, there was a lot of pressure, actually, given the success of the book. But um, I think, obviously, when something is this uh, epic in nature, in that you're seeing characters across 20 years, that's a really ex actually an exciting brief, particularly for actors. And we were really keen to cast young for the role so that, so that uh, the audience buys into these bright young things sort of early days rather than sort of a 45-year-old with a fringe <laughs> um, <laughs> cut in. So, um, yeah, that was important to us. <laughs> I did, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so that was, that was a big thing. And we... Um, yeah, it was just like a, a challenge and we just really lent into it and the casting was a huge part of it and making sure that in, in terms of like the, the production design and all the details just came, came through at, at every point. And um, I was just amazed with, with these two, how they kind of not only were prepared to wear aging bondos, which was like these kind of latex things that make you look just a bit older. I found it actually much easier to talk to them when they just had a few wrinkles. I was like, oh, okay, I can relate to you now. Um, but, um, but really, I was so impressed by how they, uh, just watching and all the other directors at Epps as well, how they just changed and held themselves differently and became more confident and, and genuinely more worldly throughout the process. That was a very beautiful thing to watch. And I did feel quite a lot of responsibility during the final episode. And, and there was a lot of conversations about whether we'd aged them enough to give the other block directors somewhere to go in the middle. That he didn't just look 27 at the end. So yeah, it was good fun. Yeah. And now, Amvika, I know that you're a big fan of the book. Huge. Yeah. Big time. As a fellow English Lit student, I yeah. feel like we're, we're obsessed with this. Um, and I'd love to know, um, what do you think is the fan service here? You know, what, what is in this series that the fans are going to be really excited about to see portrayed on, on screen in a series? Oh my God, it's such a big question. I hope that they love everything about it um, and that they hate nothing and that they think it's perfect and they have absolutely no notes. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Mic drop. Um, no, I. Uh, I mean, as I think Nicole said it, like we have just been incredibly faithful to the book. I mean, I think that was our intention going into it from everyone, and even like when I got the first audition through, I could tell from the email that I got from my agents that like this was going to be something that was going to be using this novel as its bible, um, and I think we were all just very committed to that throughout and whenever I was lost whenever I was having a day or a scene that I w that wasn't sure about or I didn't know how to tackle it like I'd always just go back to the book and like Nicole and the team of writers have just done such an amazing job of like lifting it from the page and like taking all those internal monologues taking all that context and like making this I think three-dimensional world that I think just feels so real and nostalgic and that's I think that's the feedback that we've got it's, it's sorry sorry that I was born in 1995 but people who, who lived through lived through the 80s and the 90s have been like oh it's so nostalgic and it feels so you know it's not a pastiche of that time it's a real grounded depiction and um that is uh, what it's an incredible achievement from everyone here I mean, can I, I just want to add again just to pay tribute to, to Nicole and the whole of the writing team because you know the first 12 minutes isn't in the book um, the theatre company only exists in the form of a letter so all that embellishment and filling out of the whole of the theatre company is all invention uh, the structure is, is has been you know moved around and toyed with in all kinds of really really clever ways the, the first chapter of the novel only goes up to the end of the night so that's a brilliant uh, innovation so all of the writers and Nicole working together have done amazing work and and the actors, you know, the thing you lose when you transfer a novel to the screen is you lo lose all of that inner voice. Uh, Dexter is always trying to be better, but behaving and saying terrible things, but with this intention. And the, in <laughs> the intentions on the page, it, it, in the descriptions, but but 
it's, it's wonderful when actors and directors bring out that inner voice, bring out that inner stuff that you can't put into dialogue, that you, you is on the page but isn't necessarily in action and conversation, which is what you, you mm. tend to take from a novel. Yeah, it's lovely to hear how collaborative this was. And Ambika, I'm obsessed with the fact that you just apologized for being born in 1995. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm so young. Um, I'm just so youthful. <laughs> so sorry, everyone. Now, Leo, <laughs> do you have a favorite memory from being on this set? Because talking to everyone, I can tell you just had the most amazing time. Is there something that stands out? You're laughing with each other. Do you want to do it with me? <laughs> Arthur, Arthur C. C. <laughs> it's notoriously Amica's fa favorite part of the whole shoot. Uh, not mine, because I got f food poisoning at the top of the hill. That's why it was my favorite. <laughs> um, I, I, there was I d there were so many good days, but <laughs> Amiga's going to hate this story because a really good day <laughs> was when there were seven different characters from seven different storylines, strangely all in one room. But Amica wasn't <laughs> one of them. <laughs> Emma wasn't one of them. It wasn't Basically obviously because all she the wasn't recurring there. characters were there apart uh, from me. Yeah, yeah. it <laughs> was just a, it was a kind of freak moment where suddenly all these storylines came uh, became intertwined um and that felt like a kind of special moment and obviously arthur's seat <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the biggest case of fomo of all time <laughs> but i probably was having a day off so it wasn't all it wasn't all you know she was bad <laughs> <laughs> now they nicole were just, they were just talking about you though yeah. <laughs> Nicole, you have taken a decade-spanning love story and condensed it down to 14 episodes. How did you begin to approach that? And what were the biggest challenges that you faced when trying to pack this story into 14 episodes? So difficult. It's the most difficult thing I've worked on. And I thought it would be so easy. I got the, um, I got the Microsoft Word document of the manuscript, which was such a thrill. Can you imagine having one day as a Word document? It was <laughs> amazing. So I thought... Incredible, incredible novel written by an incredible screenwriter. It's got brilliant dialogue already. Cut and paste, sorted. <laughs> Go back to my baby, cheerio. And oh my gosh, it was a fiend, wasn't it? But one of the, one of the, just basically the best, one of the best things about it was that we collaborated so closely, didn't we? So um, I, qu I really quickly got over um, how all the pressure <laughs> to do it well because it's everyone's favorite book and also unhelpful of you to have adapted Patrick Melrose so brilliantly so that was also could potentially could have been intimidating but it wasn't because I felt you were just always there um I didn't feel I had to do anything but I felt that you were well you were just a sounding board and a kind of mentor throughout so that was just that just made it easy and fun and it was I did find it really 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 difficult to um sort of arrive at a structure that would work over time. Um, but the one thing I did know from the beginning was that we had to be as interested in the two of them as individuals as we were in the love story. And because we had all this time to tell the story, that felt like an amazing opportunity to get to know these incredible characters. But it got a lot easier, not just from the sort of easy collaboration that we really quickly developed, but once Rachel Sheridan, Rachel Sheridan, uh, woo! casting director extraordinaire, um, got us these two marvels. And then, then I was writing for, for those two. And then all I ever wanted to do from the start was, you know, turn these characters inside out and really have you understand just who they were and how they changed over, over time. And because of you two and how much you're able to convey just without any dialogue at all, that felt possible. So then I was writing for you two, um, and then it, it just got a lot easier from that point. But props as well to yeah. Vene, Anna, and amazing Bijan. This is the first episode of television. Yeah. Got a hit plate at the National right now. Go, go, don't <laughs> run, don't walk. But anyway, we, we got there, and I've not even mentioned, no one's mentioned Jude and Rowana, which is ridiculous. And Anna and Mona. But anyway, it was a m massive, massive, massive collaboration. And Molly, uh, just we were just pinging things back and forth constantly, weren't we? We were. <laughs> now, David, can I ask you, did you write any of the episodes? I did, yeah. I wrote the penultimate episode. I mean, I, to be honest, because I'm a screenwriter, I thought they're going to 
they're going to have to call me in. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to take long. I'm going to get the call. Uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to a little bit roll my sleeves up. But no, I, d I mean, uh, that wasn't the case at all. The scripts were brilliant, and, uh, and I, I got to give notes, and notes were rejected, quite rightly, and that's <laughs> great. And then I got, I got to do, finally got to do an episode, the penultimate episode, which um, none of which is really from the novel. I mean, the, 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 it, the, it, something different happens towards the end of the novel. It's hard to say too much, but I had to invent a lot of stuff and write new scenes and new dialogue for Ammon and Dexter, which I, hadn't, which I hadn't done since 2007, 2008. So it was brilliant to go back and write in their voices and write knowing who would be playing them. So write with with the characters and the actors' voices combined. So that was bliss. So I've I've written the penultimate episode. Yeah. And when you got to see Ambika and Leo and you knew that they were they were playing the roles, was that a moment of being like, that's it, that's them? For me, yeah, absolutely. It was the easiest, I think I can say this for everyone, for it was the, uh, the uh, we saw some wonderful actors, but that was a really straightforward casting decision. And, and um, I, I'd seen Ambika in um, This Is Going To Hurt, which I thought was a breathtaking performance and you know, funny and heartbreaking and brilliant. And, 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 uh, and so I, that, that had been in my mind anyway. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it's been um, wonderful to see you. Know, they, they, they every act, th th there's the process of adaptation in how you change the words, but there's also the process of adaptation in what, what performers bring. And I love watching the dance on the faces and the, the, the little plays going on, the decisions and the, the confusion and the, the moments of pain that aren't in dialogue. And, and for me, but uh, not just with Emma and Dexter, but with the whole of the cast, you know, I so tribute again to Rachel and to all the actors in it. They, they do so much, and sometimes they, they do give a depth to, to the characters who are on the page. I, I have perhaps written a little bit glibly and simplistically. Uh, Eleanor, who comes in later, who plays Sylvie, she does so much with that character and makes her so much more sympathetic and, and, and less, less broadly written than she is in the novel. So I'm extremely grateful, not just to the, uh, the, the brilliant work of, the, of, of Nicole and the screenwriting team, but to all the detail and, and complexity that performers bring. And Molly, the, these three episodes that we've all just watched are set in the kind of 80s, 90s. A lot of those episodes were before the three of us on this side of the panel Understood. were yep. born. <laughs> 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 Again, apologies. <laughs> How did you find recreating those eras? Because it's so, everyone is saying it feels like you're, you're being put in a, in a, you can just transport back to that time. So how did you find recreating those eras? Um, I would say we lent very hard into the uh, preparation of it and got extremely carried away. In fact, there, were, there, was, there was one moment I was sort of squashed in the kitchen set and I was waiting for like the cameras to start rolling or something. I just opened the bread bin beside me and I was like, oh, there's some mighty white in there. Close it. That will never be seen on camera. No one is doing anything with bread. But you probably don't know what mighty white is, do you? I've got no idea. It's got <laughs> It's got brown grains, but it actually is a white bread. Um, so, no, we... Um, I know so what mighty white is. Thank you. <laughs> Could you see me, like, vacantly <laughs> nodding at you, like... He was 40 when it came <laughs> out. No, uh, it, it basically, yeah, we, we just had a lot of fun. And the, the heads of department, Patrick Rolfe and his incredible team, who uh, the production designer, um, did a sort of 200-page uh, document uh, with so many details. I was like, I had that duvet! <laughs> and, and stuff like that. And Emma Reese in the costumes. And the costumes, I was, I was nervous about having lived through the early 2000s. I was like, so we're going to put Eleanor in a, in a mohair, bolero, pink sort of mini jacket and, and white jeans. Okay, yeah. yeah, let's do it. And I was like, how do we make this look cool? And actually, when you go through it, it's just so pleasurable. So yeah, there was, there was a, lot of, a lot of attention to detail. And I have to just say about the, the hair and makeup team and the bondos again, because um, we were on up, up on our seat. <laughs> And uh, uh, Juliet, the makeup designer, was like, um, okay, we can't now film because the Bondos have, it's 40 mile an hour winds and the Bondos have filled with quite a lot of dust. And I was like, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. She's like, I don't, I don't really, I don't think it will be. And I was like, well, we have to film because we're out of time. And so we started filming, I looked on the monitor, I was like, oh my God, he looks 80. <laughs> Literally looks 80 years old. And then I was like, I promise you we will fix this in, in the grade. We'll fix it in the grade. <laughs> and, and shout out to Nigel Watson for actually fixing everything in the grade. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we had so much fun, even though these guys got none of the references. <laughs>
And we're actually going to come to some audience questions now. But while you get thinking, and please, no spoilers. Remember, the people watching at home have not yet seen these first three episodes. And if you do spoil it, the Netflix gods will come down. <laughs> and so anyway, while you think, um, I wanted to ask you, Leo and Amvika, just some one-word answer questions. So favorite location to film in? Arthur C. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Never know. Leo? Uh, London. <laughs> <laughs> and which character should we be most excited to meet in the series? Just the name. Just one that we haven't met yet. One that we haven't met yet. Any, any in the whole series? Other than your own characters. <laughs> Ian. Ian? Get to know Ian. Johnny <laughs> Weldon. Where are you? Is there someone? Hey, there he is. <laughs> you guys aren't ready for Johnny Weldon, oh honestly. <laughs> he is astounding. <laughs> no. That sounds so sarcastic, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> he's genuinely astounding in this. <laughs> and on that note, we'll pass to some audience questions. So, yes, right here. Just shout and I'll repeat. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we're actually out of time. Yeah. Um, um, I think we're out. So the question is really about the aging process. How you achieve the aging process in in the in the series? You spoke a bit about the prosthetics. What was that like wearing those? I, I mean, you kind of didn't notice, to be honest. It was just some stuff on your face. <laughs> You've always got makeup on your face, so uh, you you notice a lot more than we did, Molly. Yes, um, I think we, we, wanted to, we wanted it to be subtle because we were thinking 40 now isn't that old. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we wanted it to be yeah, a combination of, of makeup in camera, but we did use some posts where we needed to. And even just stuff like adding a lot of contrast or, or less contrast can, can bring wrinkles out or not, guys. So, um, so that, that, was, that was a big part of it. Uh, and I'm not sure about AI, but needle drops can chat about. Yeah. I mean, we had an amazing new su supervisor, Matt Bipper, who did um, I May Destroy You and Sex Education and lots of brilliant shows. And uh, it was a partly a combination of, uh, you know, we, in the same way you don't always wear costumes from 1988 to 1988, you don't always listen to the music of that year. So it's a combination of nostalgia, of reflecting the character's musical tastes, of capturing the mood of a scene. So we use sometimes use, you know, old soul tracks from the 60s. There was a great needle drop at the end of episode four, which I loved. Uh, uh, and so um, a lot of, you know, it's, it's very uh, personal and subjective, that kind of thing. And I had to try and restrain myself. I'm like the guy at the party who keeps <laughs> putting his compilation tape on. <laughs> but um, it, it was a really, really enjoyable part of the process. And also trying not to um, play too much into the cliches of, of the music of the time, not to not to be too heavy handed. You know, sometimes in you people turn on the radio and the news headlines are playing and there's a kind of musical equivalent of that where you play that song from that year. And in fact, we've often dipped into the past to people like Nick Drake and Karen Thornton and, uh, and, and more retro feeling music, which is which uh, really, really helps. For instance, in episode four is the kind of Ibiza episode. They go to Greece and it's sunny and bright and there's a lot of old 60s soul uh, in that episode that w works really, really well. But it a lot, but it was really, really, really good fun. <laughs> that, that's this is what it was like, basically. <laughs> 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 this has been a real insight into the yeah. process. Yeah. <laughs> many, many hours in the edit suite, but it, we, yeah, David was very particular, and so was our editor Mike Jones, and I knew a few tracks, <laughs> <laughs> mainly Orange Juice. No, but we, yeah, we had a lot of uh, a lot of discussion. Yeah. Any other audience questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, why, why did David not choose to adapt the every single episode? Well, I, I wrote the film script, and it's really, really hard. You know, it's so hard. And it's like, uh, it's cutting your own hair. You know, it's really, really hard to see what needs to be done and to be as dramatic as you, as you need to be and as drastic and as thorough as you need to be. You need an objective eye. And also, I've been living with these characters for... 
since, as I say, you know, 2007. So it felt like it needed a, a, a new pair of eyes. And often you get, you, 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 I was, as a, I, I sort of, I've adapted every the other versions of my books um, because it's very hard to pass it on. You feel as if you're losing control. And at the same time, you know, uh, there are brilliant decisions like, you know, opening up episode one so you play the whole of the first day so you establish the conceit. I mean, I'm sure I did give the note, I think we should stop at dawn and hold everything back, which is a stupid note. You know, then it becomes a two-hander. You don't get a sense of the premise and the scale of the thing. So it felt like I needed to step away and, uh, and allow other people to, to play. And it's been, I mean, really creatively, just b by some way, the happiest experience of my life. And I've loved what the actors have done and the, uh, the screenwriters have done amazing work. And it's been pure, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been pure joy, it really has, and I'm so proud of it. Uh, and at the same time, it's been really enjoyable to take a little step back and see them through other people's eyes. I think we have time for one last question, so make it a good one. Yeah, it is you. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, do you feel the weight of um, representation on the screen and, and portraying this character? 100%, of course. I mean, I I think one of the reasons, uh, when I first got the audition, I turned it down, famously. Um, and uh, largely because I just didn't see myself, well, I, I loved the book and I loved the character, so I just didn't see it happening, but also because I was just like, I'm not a romantic lead. I didn't see myself as a romantic lead. I thought that that, concept was absolutely absurd um, and I think when I sort of delved into that a bit more and dissected it I realized it was because I, I don't see women who look like me playing romantic leads and it took me a long 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 time like well 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 into filming for me to actually see myself as Emma and see myself as a love interest opposite someone like Leo, and like, because he's quite, you know, all right to look at. Um, <laughs> and like, it was, it, it took a long time for me to like, to like sit into that. But I do absolutely think about the representation of it all the time. And, you know, when you're on set, you're just doing a job. Some days you just, uh, just want to get the scene and you want to, you know, get in, go and get out. But a lot of the time, especially during this sh like shoot, I did feel the pressure of what this might mean to young women um, and the relevance of Emma, especially. I think, you know, Emma, correct me if I'm wrong, was, was written as a, a white woman, I assume. And I think there's so much of her identity that actually women like me who do feel marginalized, who do feel that they're not seen on television, that they're not represented, actually there's so much of her that we can relate to. Um, and what I loved about this process was that she was just able to exist in her humanity. Uh, really early on, Nicole and Rowana and Jude brought me in and we talked about it and we, made it, we created a backstory, but like it's never explicit in the script because it doesn't need to be. That's not what the story's about. The story isn't about a young brown woman and her experiences as a young brown woman in London. And it's not about that. It's about just her living her life and her relationship with Dexter and her relationship with her friends and with Ian and her career. And I'm just so glad that I was able to play a character that could just exist fully in that. And I hope that in seeing the show, young brown women or you know any young woman of color see or f find a sense of confidence in it, you know, that you, you deserve to be loved, you deserve to f you know, go after your dreams, you deserve to make mistakes and uh, fail, and not you don't deserve to fail, obviously. <laughs> you the right to fail. But your right to fail, failing is good, and Emma does all of it, and um, it's, a real, it's a real, real privilege, and I don't take it for granted, and... Um, 
I had many breakdowns about it and not feeling like I was doing enough in my position. But I was supported every step of the way by these guys and these guys. And I made something. I made something. We made something that I'm very proud of. And um, yeah, I hope that you guys feel seen by it. And Thank you. Thank you so much. That's really kind. And what a gorgeous note to end on. Um, thank you so much to everyone on this stage. Once again, a round of applause for Amber Kamad, Leah Woodall, <laughs> Nicole Taylor, David Nichols, and Molly Manners. Thank you so, so much to everyone who has tuned in to the live stream. You can watch One Day on Netflix on the 8th of February. That is this Thursday. You do not want to miss it. Thank you to everyone in the room. And once again, thank you to our amazing cast and crew.